you have your Bible with you, please turn with me to Psalm 116. Psalm 116. So we've been sauntering through the Psalms for the summer. I think we have another couple of weeks in the Psalms and then we're done. So, special welcome to our friends Tim and Danielle who came all the way from Mississippi for the weekend to be with us today. Thank you, God bless you. Psalm 116, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me, the pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish, and then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. We actually have the words on the screen, I forgot. I believed even when I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Father, we pray that you'd help us now. Help me, Lord, as I seek to open your word. Help us to understand. Above all, Lord, help us to hear the voice of the Spirit. We are dependent on you. Lord, we're not interested in just preaching another sermon or spending another 45 minutes hearing your word. But Lord, as we heard in Brad's opening prayer, we want to be changed and transformed into the image of your Son. And we pray that you do that now for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 116 is part of uh, six psalms called the Hallel Psalms, 113 through 118. Uh, Hallel means praise. So we have hallelujah, praise the Lord. And so these are praise songs and they refer partly to the deliverance from Egypt. Why that's important is because they form part of the Passover Seder to the Jews at the time of Jesus and still in many Jewish groups today. And so the first two of those psalms are sung at the beginning of the Passover and then the other four are sung at the end of the Passover. You say, well, that's all very interesting. What does that mean? Well, it's actually referred to in the book of Mark and in the book, Gospel of Matthew. It says that when they had sung a hymn, that's Jesus had the Passover with his disciples, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So Jesus, I believe, sang this psalm just before he went to be crucified. And so as we look at the psalm, we can interpret it in three ways. And I really struggle uh, to uh, bring this to you today because there is just so much in the psalm. And there are just so many ways that we can interpret and there are so many verses that we can spend a long time on. I want to extract one particular aspect of that this morning. 
But we can also, and I would encourage you to go home and to look at the psalm again in the light of the fact that Jesus sang the song or prayed this prayer, if you will, just before his crucifixion. And then look at all of the verses, how that applies to the Lord Jesus. The psalm is most commonly interpreted in terms of God just answering prayer. And so most commentators and preachers will speak about the psalm as how God answers prayer. I want to look at it this morning from a third angle, and that is that it is a story of our salvation. Now when you look at the psalm, the Hebrew way of writing things is a little different to the way we do things. When we tell a story, or when we say something, we, we have a whole build-up, and then we come to the conclusion. Now, I'm not very good at that in my preaching. Some preachers are better at it. I tend to have the conclusion all the way along, so I have many conclusions, so you just get happy and think, well, we're going to go home. <laughs> but, but in the Hebrew thinking, the introduction gives you a summary of the whole of the psalm. And so the first two verses really sums up the whole of the psalm. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. Why do I love him? Because he heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore I will call on him as long as I live. That's the bottom line. That, is, that would be the, the, the punchline, if you will, in our way of doing things. And then he begins to give us the explanation for these two verses. And I'm not going to go verse by verse because we just don't have the time. I wish I could. And so I've extracted two points. So you can tell Pastor Josh that I at least got to two points. Point number one, what has the Lord done? Point number two, what will I do? You can also tell Pastor Josh that both my points start with the same letter. <laughs> what has the Lord done? And what will I do? And so let's begin in what the Lord has done. The first thing he has done is he's heard my cry. You saw that in the introduction. The Lord heard my cry. And verse 1 says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. And I'm going to apply this in the sense that he heard my prayer when I called out to him for salvation. He heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Now I know that there are many versions of the gospel and many people have different ways of presenting the gospel and many times the gospel is, is mispreached these days because it is sold on its features, advantages and benefits. For those who are in sales, you may recognize those ideas. This is what the gospel will do for you. No, the gospel is that I am a wretched sinner and I'm destined for hell. And when we understand our, our terrible situation, that we are without God and without hope in the world, the right response is simply, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Not Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll sign the decision card because you're going to fix my marriage and you're going to help me with my finances and you're going to do this and that and the other thing for me. That's not the gospel. And so when we understand our, our, our desperate situation, we cry out to the Lord and the wonderful good news is that he hears. And so everyone, Paul says in Romans, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I thank God for his grace and his mercy that each one of us who have called upon his name 
and said, Lord, save me. He's heard us. And he doesn't turn away. I don't believe that there is anyone who's ever called upon the name of the Lord for salvation that has been turned away. And certainly those who are born again here this morning know the joy and the experience of having come and said, Lord, I am undone. I have nothing. I am without hope. Please save me. And he hears our voice. Can you imagine if God was the way we are sometimes? We don't have time to hear the cries of people around us. A brother spoke this morning about a situation where people were in desperate need. And thank God for the church who heard that cry and reached out. But you know, somehow we become good at selective hearing. And I'm not talking about husbands. <laughs> but there's so many needs around us, so many cries for help. And we, we, we get good at not, at not hearing and not seeing. But God hears the faintest cry. He hears the, the stillest voice that as we just in our desperation in that moment just cry out to him. He hears us. And he saves us from death. Some people look at this passage and they say, well, he's, you know, this, the, the author, and we don't know who the author was, was in a desperate situation and, and it was as though he was going to die. I, to me, this speaks about where you and I were. Because the soul that sins, it will die. And every one of us had upon us a sentence of death. The problem is that we generally don't like to face the facts. But we have a sickness and it's called sin. And the prognosis of that sickness is sure. And it is death. And it's not temporal death, but eternal death. Eternal damnation. And in our lost estate, the Lord saved us. Now as the, uh, as the psalmist is writing, it seems that, in he, that God just reaches out and just saves. But we know in order for, to save us, he had to give his son. And Jesus had to die in our place upon the cross of Calvary. And so it's not just a matter of him saying, okay, I'll save you. But in order to save us, a terrible price had to be paid. And so the snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of shul laid hold on me of hell. I suffered distress and anguish. We don't like to preach about hell anymore. And sometimes I wonder why we have half-baked salvations. Why people are not really born again. The Lord preserved the simple. When I was brought low, He saved me. You see, I spoke a few weeks ago about the fact that the Lord doesn't use mighty and powerful. He uses simple people. And when we understand our simplicity, when we understand that we have nothing to boast of, that we are weak and frail, those are the ones that the Lord is able to, to help because the others think, well, I can do it. I can live my life. I can save myself. But when we understand that we are poor and wretched. The Spirit of Jesus writes to the church in Laodicea, and, he, and, and this really is a message to modern Christians. Because they say we're rich and increased with goods, we have need of nothing. And in the context of the Laodicean church, they didn't even need Jesus because they'd locked him out and he's standing outside and he's knocking for entry back into his church. And he says, you don't know that you're wretched Miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And this is the sad reality is that most of the world don't understand that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But when we understand that we are in a desperate situation, the Lord is able to intervene. And He comes and He saves us. Verse 8, For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from from stumbling. 
What a wonderful work has he not done. And folk, I think the problem is that sometimes we forget where we have come from. In fact, Peter writes about that and he says that those who don't grow in their faith, and I'm just summarizing two, two verses, have forgotten that they were purged from their former sins. It's easy to forget that we were saved from a horrible pit. It's easy to forget how miserable and rotten and wretched we were before Christ. And when you've been saved for a long time, the longer you're saved, the more you get used to the idea, well, I, I was always saved. We need to remember where we've come from. It doesn't mean that we grovel in our sin or revel in the memories of the stuff that we were involved in. But we remember where we come from. And the, and the writer says, I remember that I was in a bad way. But the Lord came and he saved me and he rescued me. And then the next question is then, what will I give to the Lord? Now let me just say by introduction to this section that I don't want you to get the impression that I'm suggesting that we pay God back. You cannot pay God back. The price that was paid for us is a unbelievably dear price. What does a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing could buy your soul but the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what will I give in exchange? I can give nothing to pay him back. And I also want to be sure that as we launch into the rest of the sermon that you don't get the impression that I'm laying a guilt trip on you and saying, well, I have to serve him. The point that the writer is making is the Lord has done so much for me. How can I worship him? How can I thank him? What can I give? in appreciation. You see, there's a difference between paying for something and giving something out of appreciation, out of gratitude, out of thankfulness. And when we begin to understand what the Lord has done for us, and this is the problem, is that we don't often, often don't understand, but when we understand what the Lord has done for us, there can only be one response. In the words of the closing hymn, were the whole realm of nature mine that were a gift far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. There can be no other response but to say, here am I, Lord. You've given yourself to me. What can I give? And even if everything in the world was at my disposal, it would still be too small a gift to thank him for what he has done. And so I'm going to take four things out of the, and there are others in the, in, the, in the text. But the first one is, sorry, verse 13, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will lift up the cup of salvation and I looked at this idea of the cup of salvation. It doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible. It's only in this, in this psalm. So, so how do we interpret that? Well, we need to look at the, at the cup. The cup is used in the Old Testament predominantly as an as a image of judgment. An image of judgment that God's wrath is in a cup. And he meets that out to Israel. And he says, you will drink. And then in the book of Revelation, the same idea. And then you find that Jesus asks his disciple, can you drink the cup that I have to drink? 
What was that cup? It was the wrath of God. God's judgment on Jesus because of my sin. And because, of, because God's wrath had to be poured out on me because, because I am a sinner, Jesus stands in the breach and he takes all of God's judgment and all of God's wrath upon him and he drinks that cup to the bitter dregs. And then the only other place where we read about the cup is obviously in the communion. And in the communion, we take the cup. And it reminds us that Jesus drank the wrath of God, that we might drink his salvation. And as we take the cup of the Lord, month by month, it is there to remind us of God's grace. And folk, again, we, we can get into a ritual and we do it. And in some traditions, they do it every day. Some traditions, it's every week. Most of my life, I was in churches where it was every week. And it becomes custom. And it becomes, it's just something that we do. And I pray that next time we come to the Lord's table again, we may again be made aware of the depth of the, of the judgment that Jesus took upon himself. And the price he paid in order to save me. In order that I might drink of his goodness and his blessing. And as David writes in Psalm 23, my cup overflows. You see, he drank the bitterness that we might drink the blessing of God. And so he says, I will lift up the cup of salvation. And I will remind myself again that the Lord has saved me out of his goodness and his mercy. And I will call upon the name of the Lord. Verse 14. Sorry. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. I will pay my vows to the Lord. You see, if when you got saved, you prayed the right prayer, and I'm not going to get technical here, but part of the right prayer is, Lord, I accept you as my Savior and my Lord my master, my boss. You see, you can't have him as savior and not have him as Lord. I know there's a doctrine that goes about the saying that there are two different stages in salvation. And it's called lordship salvation. I don't buy into that. I don't believe that you can accept him as savior unless you accept him as Lord at the same time. And when you accept him as Lord, you say, Lord, I'll serve you. And we make certain promises to him. In fact, there is not one of us here this morning who has not made certain promises to God. Lord, I'll serve you. Lord, this week, I'm going to get my life straight. Lord, I'm going to stop doing thing, these things today. But how often do we keep those vows? I'm not going to ask you about your New Year's resolutions even. We know how those go. But folk, we, we make promises to God. We make commitments to God. And we make them easily. And we break them just as easily. And I want to challenge you this morning that if the Holy Spirit is putting his finger on something in your life where you've made a commitment and a promise to God and you've not kept that, you need to get back to it and keep it. The book of Malachi tells the story of a man. And, and I find it so graphic and I find it so real because it's, it's just the way it really seems to happen in so many of our lives. He says there's this man who goes at the time of at, at lambing season when the sheep and the goats have lambs. And he looks at all of the little lambs and he says, God has really blessed me. Look at what the Lord has done for me. What I'll do is I have this 
perfect specimen over here. It's a ram. And I'm going to take it, and I'm, when, it's, when it's a year old, I'm going to take it and sacrifice it to the Lord. And then the lamb grows, and it becomes a beautiful, strong animal. And the day comes, and he has to take that lamb, that sheep, or that goat, and take it to the temple and go and sacrifice it. And he looks at it and he says, can't do it. But I have this one over here and it's crippled. Or that one is sick and is going to die. I'll take that and bring that to the temple and offer that to the Lord. And God through Malachi says, cursed is that man. Now, folk, how many of us have made commitments to God and when, it comes, when push comes to shove, we don't deliver on our promises? And we give him something that is second and third best. Because the Lord has saved me, I will pay my vows. And I will do so in the presence of all his people. And I don't have the time to preach a whole other sermon, but we have a... We have a problem these days of lone ranger Christians who think they can serve God in front of their televisions and YouTube. No, we serve Him here. We bring our sacrifice of praise here. We keep our vows here. And we keep one another accountable for our promises and our vows to the Lord. Verse 17, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Three times he speaks about calling on the name of the Lord. The sacrifice of thanksgiving. And the New King James uses the word praise. And so we can say, well, it, it simply means I worship God during... How long was it? 40 minutes this morning? Of worship. That's where I bring my sacrifice of praise. No, it's a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and I don't just do that during the time of worship. And right now, some of you are getting edgy because lunchtime is drawing near, and the preacher still has a long way to go. <laughs> and it's a sacrifice to sit and listen. And submit yourself to the word of God. But that is part of our sacrifice of thanksgiving. The way you treat your husband. The way you treat your wife. The way you raise your kids. The way you do your job. The way you keep your yard. All of these are ways in which we worship the Lord. And we thank him through those things. But I want you to notice that it has this word sacrifice. And that's a word we don't like. Yeah, we, we're quite happy with the fact that Jesus made the sacrifice on the cross. But because he sacrificed, I don't have to sacrifice. No, the psalmist says, because of what he has done, I will bring the sacrifice of praise. And folk, a sacrifice is something that costs. And that's painful. The man who had to take that ram that was the best of his flock and give that to the Lord, that was a sacrifice. But when he took the one that was going to die anyhow, that was crippled, that was nothing. And the problem is that it's easy for us to give to the Lord the things that are the remnants of our life. The time we don't really have much other use for. A little bit of money that's left at the end of the month. If I come to the end of the week and I've done my job and enjoyed myself and done everything, if there's some energy left, I'll make it to church on Sunday morning. No, it's a sacrifice. And you remember that David was touring the land and he was counting the cost of God's judgment upon him and his people because of his disobedience. 
And he finally comes to a man who was threshing the wheat. His name was Arona. And he says to Arona, I need to make a sacrifice to God. And Arona says, well, you're the king. Here's my threshing floor. You can use that for the altar. Here are the instruments, the winnowing forks and the other implements of threshing. You can use those to make the fire. And here's the oxen that tread out the corn. You can use those and sacrifice to the Lord. And I trust you know what David's response was. No. I will, I will pay you for it. I will buy it from you at a price. Because I will not offer to the Lord that which cost me nothing. I will not offer to the Lord what cost me nothing. And folk, we will give to the God, Lord those things that cost us nothing. But when it's going to cost you something, we say, no, it's too much. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. There is nothing that you can give that can, that, that can even begin to express gratitude for what the Lord has done for us. Verse 16, I'm jumping around. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant. The son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. Lord, I am your servant. The word servant in the Old Testament in Hebrew can be either a paid servant or a slave. But in the New Testament, whenever you find that word servant, it is the Greek word doulos. We touched on this in men's Bible study on Thursday, and it means slave. And Paul introduces many of his letters, and he says, I, Paul, a slave of the Lord. You see, because Paul understood that he had been bought with a price and that he was not his own. And that the Lord was entitled to have everything he had and everything he is. In the book of Exodus, it makes provision for a man who was a Hebrew slave to be set free after seven years. And so if a man had to sell himself because he got into debt... He would serve for six years, and on the seventh year, he was to go out free because no Israelite was to be enslaved permanently. But when the man came to the end of that period, and the time came for him to be set free, he could choose and say, I love my master. I don't want to go free. And he could choose to remain a slave because he recognized he couldn't make it on his own and also his, his master had given him a wife. And it says then that man was to be taken to the elders of the city and his ear was to be put to the doorpost and they were to pierce his ear with an awl. Just the same way as Ladies and some men. That would be a sign. Whenever anyone saw him, this man had chosen to be a slave. A slave by choice. And the psalmist says, I am your slave by choice. Because you have loosed my bonds. You see, because he has he set us free from the bondage of sin and of death. And because he set us free from the oppression of sin, that we might go, not that we might go free, but that we might serve him. You see, sometimes we, we sing those songs about freedom as we did this morning, and, and it's all about I'm free so I can do whatever I want. No, he didn't set us free just to be free. He set us free that we might be able to serve him. The, these psalms are also referred to the Egyptian Hallel psalms because a lot of them refer to some of the, the stuff of Israel coming out of Egypt. And you remember that Moses would go to Pharaoh and he would say, God wants to set the people free so that they can go and worship him. He didn't bring them out of Egypt just to deliver them. 
He brought them out of Egypt to bring them to himself. And when God gives the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, he begins the Ten Commandments by saying, I have brought you on eagle's wings to myself. In fact, there's a, there's a misunderstanding today amongst many Christians who believe that we've been, we've been saved just to be free. No, we've been saved that the Lord might have us. That we might serve Him. And, and we, we serve Him. We, you see, again, a, a, we, we like to be in control. We like to be the boss. We like to be the head and not the tail. But He saved us that we might serve Him. That we might serve one another. And He sets that example as He washes His disciples' feet. And folk, we, we serve him not just by coming here on a Sunday morning and warming a pew and putting a few bucks on the plate. We serve him in so many ways. We serve him by helping to clean the building. See, this is where the rubber hits the road. Mowing the lawn. And I thank God for brothers and sisters who are faithful in those things. The team who've been painting the offices this last week. And I came in on Friday. And I was just blessed by not just what they were doing. But the joy with which they were doing the things. By helping in Sunday school. In the nursery. There's a thousand ways in which we can serve. But folk, we all want to be served. If he who is the master became our servant, can we not be one another's servants? Can we not serve one another in real and practical ways? And so I want to challenge you again, and here's another challenge this morning. Please go home and say, can I serve more? Can I serve better? Is there another area in which I can serve the Lord? And folk, when we serve him, we serve him with excellence. I, I think that sometimes we say, well, you know, the Lord needs to be grateful. I'm, I'm, I'm giving him something. I'm going to do half a job, but it's fine. He's gracious. He's merciful. He understands. Is that what you think of your salvation? Folk, everything we do for him. Whether you're, whether you're singing up here, whether you're preaching, whether you're praying, whether you're witnessing, whether you're cleaning the toilets, we do it with excellence. Because he's worthy of the best. And when we do half a job, we're simply saying, it doesn't matter. Deacons do their job to their very best. Elders do their job to the very best. Musicians do the job to the very best. The technicians on the soundboard do the job to your very best ability because he is worthy of everything that we're able to bring. And he's worthy of our very best. In the same passage in the book of Malachi, and I'm going to draw to a conclusion, but the same passage in Malachi, he says that sacrifice that you brought to God he says, give it to your governor and see if he's going to be happy with that crippled sheep. We would not, he would, you would not give your governor a half-dead animal, but you'll give it to the Lord. Folks, sometimes I, we, we need to get practical. If you served your boss the way you served the Lord, will you still have a job? If you got up on Sunday, on Monday morning and said, well, uh, uh, it's a good day for fishing. I'm not going to go to work today. You think you're going to have a job? You think your boss is going to be happy with you? And yet we do that with the Lord? With the King of glory?
I've run out of time. But I want to close with a story that I have told many times. And yet it is absolutely important for me to share my heart on this because it does illustrate the point I'm trying to make. I was 17 years old, younger than Dylan. And my pastor had invited me to go to a conference of pastors. I mean, I was just a kid, didn't understand half of what was going on. But one evening, an old missionary lady sang a special or a song. And it's burnt into my memory. For some reason, the piano was an old upright piano was standing that side, facing that way. I don't know who the lady is. I never found out. But she sat down and began to sing the song. And it changed my life. It's burnt into my memory. It affects everything I say and everything I do. And you ask, why do you preach the way you do? Why do you feel so intensely about the things that you feel so intensely about? It's because of this song. And I'll only share one verse with you. By and by, when I look on his face, beautiful face, thorn shadowed face, by and by, when I look on his face, I'll wish I had given him more. More. So much more. More of my love than I ever gave before. By and by, when I look on his face, I wish I had given him more. You see, because on that day, I will understand for the first time the price he paid. I only have a glimpse of what it cost him, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. But that day, I will understand what it cost him who knew no sin to become sin for me. And to take upon him my judgment and my wrath. And I wish I'd given him more. Father, I pray that these may not just be thoughts or some kind of emotional reaction. But Lord, that you may change our lives as you changed my life that day. As I dedicated every moment of my life from then on. Pray, Lord, that you'd keep me faithful to that promise I made on that day. That I'll serve you with all my heart. And I pray, Lord, that every one of us here this morning will make that commitment. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.